Hello, everybody. Terrence Lehew here with another episode of the Intellectual Agrarian Podcast, where we talk philosophy from the farm. Today's guest is Ted LeBeau from Kitchen Table Consultants, a business consulting firm that focuses on helping farming and food-related enterprises. With Ted, we'll be talking about his first business venture as a farm, what kind of work Kitchen Table Consultants does, and dive into a report they produce with the Pennsylvania Association of Sustainable Agriculture on the state of meat processing in Pennsylvania for local farmers. Don't miss this episode with Ted LeBeau. Ted LeBeau, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's great to be here. Before we get started here, can you share a little bit about yourself and your background with the audience? Sure. Um, I am CEO and co-founder of a company called Kitchen Table Consultants. Uh, Kitchen Table Consultants provides business management consulting for food and farm related businesses up and down the eastern seaboard. We have uh, 13 consultants on our team, um, and actually the Eastern Seaboard and uh, Chicago and California. We work uh, with uh, only food-related businesses. A third of our businesses are actual farms, and we call them producers. A third of our clients are in the supply chain, which is anything from coming off of the farm until it actually gets into your mouth. So restaurants, uh, uh, retail stores, manufacturers, logistics firms, distributors, Without anybody doing value add, and then the final third of our business is with nonprofits, uh, and, and then these are all nonprofits that work in the, in and around the in the food system. We work very specifically in business management, so we help people set their books up. We do we help them with their marketing strategy, marketing execution. We'll help them drive sales. We will uh, build their leadership teams, and then we'll do strategy. And strategy encompasses a combination of feasibility studies. Uh, business plans, fundraising, um, and then, of course, strategy, uh, you know, how you build and grow your business. We've been around for, oh, I don't even remember. It's four or five years, six years now, um, and uh, we're planning on growing significantly in the near future. And I'd imagine that there is no end to the ability to grow considering today's market for value-added food, not only with labels in terms of organics, non-GMO, but just a general interest in people eating and living more sustainably. Yeah, we, you know, probably our biggest issue right now is finding qualified consultants in order to join our team. We have a pretty deep pipeline of, you know, requests for our help. Um, And uh, yeah, I would, that's probably the biggest issue. There's a lot of demand for what we do. Mm -hmm. So I'm just curious, uh, your consultants, do they have agricultural backgrounds? So our consultants, uh, there's, th- so we have a couple of different levels of a consultant. We have called our entrepreneurs and residents, and then we have associate consultants. The entrepreneurs and residents have to have run a business um, of their own or somebody else's. If it's their own, it's okay if they're still running it and they want to do this you know, part-time. If it's somebody else's, they have to have been fired. They have in every case, our entrepreneurs and residents have to have run a business bigger than what they are consulting with. And then to answer your question, sorry, Terrence, I wasn't answering it directly. <laughs> well, now is, is do they have agricultural experience? And the answer is uh, not necessarily, but they have to have a food, uh, you know, a food interest. Mm-hmm. So, you know, uh, my you know my original my original business, uh, you know, a long time ago. I'm going to date myself in, in the in the eighties was a farm. Uh, my business partner has a ton of uh, experience on farm and with farm markets. Um, you know, Noah Monroe, our, one of our entrepreneurs and residents, is, uh, ran a fudge business. Um, you know, Rebecca Frimmer, our, one of our entrepreneurs and residents, is, is uh, you know has run a has run a you know a hydroponic farm, albeit small, but has worked in multiple food related companies and nonprofits. So, um, no, you don't have to have agricultural experience, but we, you do have to have entrepreneurial experience, and you have to have a passion for food. Mm-hmm. Which are two really good things when you're consulting on those things. Yep. Uh, what led to your interest in sustainable agriculture to begin with? <laughs> well, I, as I said, I, my first business was a farm. When I was 13, I bought a tractor. My father was a physician, and he um, co-signed on my loans. And um, I really love just you know farming, growing food, growing animals. I wanted to be a large animal veterinarian and a D minus in intro animal science at Cornell determined that I wasn't going to do that. <laughs> uh, 
to his intro animal physiology, I got an A in the, the animal science part because you had to handle animals, which I did very well, but the, 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 the biology, et cetera, was too much. But over the years, you know, I mean, that, that sort of that foundation of working with the land and the soil and animals has always stuck with me. And then I guess seven or eight years ago, I got reintroduced as I was doing. I've run 14 businesses and owned all a part of 10, all manufacturing and distribution related. And actually none other than the first one that was directly related to food or farming. And then I got back involved by working with a startup seven years ago. And I've always just, you know, I, I like eating food. And one of my favorite things in the world is to smell really good soil. Like there's just mm -hmm. something about that smell and the feel. And as I, you know, as, as life has evolved, you start looking at, you know, sustainable systems. And, and so we really focus on the financial sustainability, but we're doing it because we believe that the, that the soil and the farming starts at a really base level. And I, and I want to be careful here because I don't, I have no issue with conventional farmers. I don't actually mm -hmm. think conventional farmers are trying to do something bad. Mm -hmm. I think that they've just got a certain level of capital inputs. In fact, I think they, they believe they are doing something really good and they are providing very, the best quality food in the best way that they've been taught how. I just think that there's some new, no, there's new knowledge. My mother sent me this, you know, this thing out of USA Today, my mom's great at sending reports and it's been sitting in my desk and it says why veggies aren't as nutritious anymore. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it really talks about soil health and, and I, I, and I'm a very strong believer that the reality is, is that I'm, I am very concerned about my great, 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 great grandchildren because I think that the, that the qual that the issues with how we are sustainably raising our crops and animals now will be significantly more evident in a long in the long term, mm -hmm. not as they are now. So I, I don't know if I answered your question or not. No, that's a really good answer. Are you familiar with epigenetics or Pottinger's uh, cats? I am not. Okay, so just the quick summary for you and the audience: epigenetics is the science of basically what you eat affecting your progeny. Mm. And yep. Pottinger was a guy who tested just with these cats. He fed them different foods to see how their children ended up. And it yep. was rather startling that the more processed a food was, the worse health-wise the cat's future litters ended up looking. The good yep. news was by feeding them good whole foods, they were able actually to reverse the degeneration of their genetics, if you will, over time. So it really is something that we do have to be concerned about is those future generations. Yeah. The iteration of the future, I think, you know, my mother calls it cathedral thinking, like how many generations down when thousands of years ago, when somebody would build a cathedral, those cathedrals, you know, took multi, multi, multi generations to build. So the father, the son, the grandson, et cetera, had to be thinking so far out because of how long it took in those days to do that. And that's the same thing. I, I read an article in the Smithsonian, I, and I wish I'd saved it, like five, six, seven years ago, where somebody was doing genetic testing around glyphosate in mice. And the generational retention of that was huge number of generations that, that, you know, that it stayed in their systems, generation to generation. That's scary to me. I just don't know what's going to happen, but it doesn't feel right. Now, this is just kind of a side tangent almost, but the quote is applicable. I just found this Native American proverb the other day. We do not inherit the earth from our ancestors. We borrow it from our children. Yeah, I've heard that before. That's, yeah, that is exactly right. I, there was a, I was at a PASA conference two years ago, and a, and a speaker, I forget his name, he's a prominent person in sustainable agriculture, and he wrote a book where he penned a letter from a granddaughter to a grandmother but like in, in future years, right? So the granddaughter was writing to, to the granddaughter and grandmother today saying, why didn't you take better care of the earth? It's a wow. pretty profound statement. I mean, it's just a pretty profound statement. Yeah. So what made you decide to get a farm as your first business venture? <laughs> I was 13, didn't know any better. And hey, there was, you... <laughs> <laughs> was a bunch of land and, and stuff around. And well, I mean, I grew up in, uh, in, in Idaho outside of a little town called Nampa. And at the time, you know, my neighbors were farmers. And, and for whatever reason, they took me under their wing as, and I, you know, I would go to each of their neighbors and, and, and uh, go to the neighbors and help them farm. Like I dug ditch, at age 13, I was digging ditches. I was bucking 
hay. I was chasing cattle. And um, it, it just was something that felt good to me. And then I, you know, I've got, I've always had the entrepreneurial spirit, or maybe that was what the start of it was. Is that I, my parents owned ten acres of property that they weren't farming. In fact, it was in weeds, and it bothered me immensely that it wasn't somehow being productive. And um, I just, it just felt right. I mean, it just, you know, it was, it was entrepreneurial, and you were doing something that was growing something that was going to be used for food for somebody else. There's something very gratifying in that process. It really is gratifying. If any of you listening have grown even just vegetables in your windowsill garden, you have an idea of the immense satisfaction you can get by raising something for someone to eat. Yeah, the, my favorite part actually was feeding cattle early mm. in the morning on a winter day. You know, yes. like, you know, turning the lights on, you know, I had lights out to the corrals and the hay barn and going out and knowing that you were helping to take care of another animal, uh, you know, ultimately was going to be turning into food, but it, it was very gratifying to feed the, fe- the hay bunks, to know that I grew the hay, that I was taking care of the animals in the best way I knew how, and to, and to see them feeling, you know, g- gaining some comfort out of that. And, and, and by the way, you know, there's a very different mind, not a different mindset, but people are, from my experience, people are either crop and vegetable farmers, you know, uh, or they're animal farmers. It, it, it's a very different approach. Yes, yes, there is a bit of a divide from one to and the I other. Can't, and I can't grow grass or garden stuff to, to, for my life. I'm horrible at it. But but animals I do pretty well with. So I'm curious, what made you guys decide to start Kitchen Table Consultants? Oh, yeah. Um, that's a funny, that's a strange story. Uh, so after running 10 business, uh, after running about 14 businesses and, and owning all a part of 10 of them, in 2008, I had finished doing a turnaround on a manu- on a printing facility up in central New Jersey, and as a result of that, I had a I had some runway after finishing that turnaround that that allowed me a year of kind of and that was 2008 of kind of figuring out what I wanted to do when I grew up. And I started just working with small business entrepreneurs by myself, and I said to myself, I just want to. I hadn't stayed anywhere, done anything for more than you know a couple of years, three four years, and I said I want to figure out what I want to be when I grow up. I'm 51, so that's what, uh, 2008, 10 years ago, I was 41, and uh, I said, I'm going to spend five years doing consulting to figure out what I want to be when I grow up, and in the middle of, so about four years into that, I got introduced to a startup called Philly Cowshare that was selling bundles of, actually, she wasn't selling bundles, she pitched me on the idea when she was eight months pregnant, and I said, I love that idea, and I said, I'll help you, and I did it for sweat equity, and then, you know, so I got into the, the food and farm, and then and just started getting into it by accident. And then my my now business partner, Jen Brodsky, I met as she was leaving, uh, running a farm, a nonprofit farm. And she asked me to kind of mentor her through finding her next job. And after about two or three months of that, it was, you know, it was, it was clear to me that she shouldn't be working for anybody else. She just, you know, she just had too much of an entrepreneurial mindset. And about eight months, nine months after that, she was started doing some consulting work. And she said, Ted, I, I just really don't like the name of your of your, of your business. My business was named after my three daughters, JRI Consulting, Jess, Rebecca, and Isabella. I said, okay, look, I I don't insult my daughters, but do whatever you want. And she says, well, I'd really like to build out this business that has more to do with food and farming. And, and, and in that process, she, that's all the business that she was doing. She had those relationships and I was building them. And she, she built out the the website and all the marketing materials. And she just, you know, she just got very excited about this pure sweat equity. And I went, man, this is awesome. Like I get to, like, I get to work with farms and food related people. I love them. They're really amazing entrepreneurs. They tend to be more passionate than business minded, which actually is good for us. Although I find that across most industries, I've, you know, I've consulted with over eh, probably close to 500 businesses as a consultant, um, a little over half are food and farm businesses. I had a, you know, JRI consulting was, you know, didn't, I was agnostic to the, the industry. We just we just kept seeing this need and 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 the results. I mean, you know, it is so much fun to work with an entrepreneur that that listens and then does stuff. I, I mean, I get out of bed every day going, "This is amazing." I'm in an industry that I love. Anytime I want to go on a farm, I can go on a farm. Although I'll be most of my personal clients are no longer farms. I have a couple that are still farms. I'm really working more in the supply chain, which hence comes from the you know the project that you that we that ultimately you found us through. Um, 
And it was, it's just been one of those things where, where um, it's just been an amazing journey to help entrepreneurs achieve their dreams and not make the mistakes that we have made. And, and, and the, the, the rewards are, you know, we get to help farmers, like family farm businesses. How much more romantic and down to earth can that be? I don't know. I mean, that, that maybe, I hope that answers your question. That does. And you're right. It really, that's one of those things that I've grown up around farmers my entire life. And they are passionate about what they do. They're great entrepreneurs, but sometimes they don't have, they need a little helping hand with some of the business stuff. And that's why an organization like yours is really helpful. Yep, correct. Helping hand is a nice way of putting it. Sometimes they need a slap on the side of the head or a two by four or something like that. But yeah. Cattle prod, (laughs) using agricultural terms, cattle prod. I think I'd rather use a two by four than a cattle prod. Cattle prod has a little, yeah, but yeah, correct. agree. Yes, they need... And, and it's not just farmers. It is and, and anybody in the local sustainable foods movement. There is a component of it that's very mission driven, and which I love. But if you if you lose sight of the of the business financial piece, you end up in a very different place. Mm-hmm. Kind of makes it hard to keep going on the mission when you can't make money. Uh, it's like, yeah, yeah. There you go. Perfect. I won't. I wouldn't say it any better than that. Uh. I'm not sure if you've heard this quote before, but I think it was Walt Disney. People accused him about, oh, you're just making too much money. He said, we make money to make movies. We don't make movies to make money. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, we do something similar in that we have a, a sliding scale with clients where if we've got we've got certain clients that can afford to pay us you know, full rates and then other clients who can't. And we slide the scale to make sure we're helping the, 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 you know, the people that we need to help too, not just those that can afford us. Mm-hmm. Now, Kitchen Table Consultants recently teamed up with the Pennsylvania Association of Sustainable Agriculture to produce a report on the meat industry. Would you mind discussing that a little bit? <laughs> sure. Um, we, we, we put together a report. Um, uh, you know, we, we were asked to put together a report or participate in putting together a report that was around what's going on in the meat industry, specifically around sort of southeastern, south central Pennsylvania. Um, you know, the, the goal was to understand well, one of the things that's ha- that happens in Pennsylvania regularly is, is that, you know, we have all of, I, I actually think we are number one in the direct consumer sales of, of, you know, of food. And number, and I know for a fact we are number two in organic sales. Mm-hmm. Um, and so one of the things that we, that as we wander around, kitchen table wanders around the, the countryside, we get asked regularly for processors, you know, beef processors, because the best beef processors here are booked out anywhere from a year to a year and a half out. So it's really tough from an animal producer standpoint to be, you know, to, if you want to grow that your herd, we've got this this whole booking issue. So the pr- the basic premise was, hey, you know, let's understand what you know what if you want to start a, a processing facility, let's get some base level building bro- blocks together. And so we we, you know, together with Pasta, we we said, well, what would be the building blocks that you would want to have? Number one, we'd want to understand what the the the, the farmers think they need. So less about you know, will the consumer buy it? It's what what. You, you farmers who are farming right now, what do you need? Number two was, you know, and, and so the idea here was is that we're building some some foundational information for somebody who's either in the processing business or wants to get into the processing business, right? That, so it's number one, hey, what do the farmers want here? Number two was, what what are the best practices of the of smaller processors? And number three was, and this is kind of twofold, was, is, you know, everybody, this was just something that we get asked all the time. Two things. Well, what should I structure it? You know, like what should be, you know, what should be the corporate form? Should it be a sole, sole proprietorship? And then, then the last one, which is always the fun one, was how do I get money, right? And so what we did was just basically provide some really foundational. We went out and surveyed. Pasa put together a survey. Well, we and Pasa together put together a survey. I think we surveyed almost uh, 54, 54 farms uh, representing 100,000 animals a year. Um, and, you know what, what you know. What do you want, and, and what do you need? Um, we we went out to uh, you know to I think six or seven um, non-competing, meaning not from this region uh, that we were studying uh, meat processors, and found their best practices. And then we we put together twenty. You know, we found twenty-one funders that are that that actually have an interest in funding something like this. And then we built a whole chart of legal entities 
that talks about, you know, hey, how do you set this up and what are the best, you know, how does it look like? Make sense? Yes, it does. Thank you. Reading over the report and a couple of the things, I grew up on an organic beef farm. And part of my job was actually to get it scheduled for the butcher date. So I can really appreciate the issue that was involved in this because, I mean, a really good butcher is pretty much, he's an artisan almost. Yes. And there are so few of them that have, at least in my area, I'm in uh, northern Illinois, southern Wisconsin, there aren't that many that are A, really good at what they do, and B, have the proper licensing for Mm -hmm. where you want to sell. Yeah, I, you know, I mean, what's interesting about this is is that it, it, yeah, we've done a number of studies like this over the years. A couple of things. Number one, it's not actually manufacturing; it's actually deconstruction, which creates a whole other set of parameters, right? Um, number two, uh, what we find, we've done a number of studies here around it, is is that there, you know, it's not. Let's just face it; it's not a sexy industry. Butchering, mm-hmm. so getting new people into it is really tough. And number three. You know, it is a critical component in local sustainable, you know, accessibility to these meats because, you know, the, the larger firms, you know, larger processors don't, don't want to do one or two or three or ten animals. They want to do a hundred. Um, and they don't want to do a specialty cut. They want to do it the way they cut it. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, you, they are a critical component of the social local uh, fabric that needs to be successful in order to be able to to. to help, you know, these small local sustainable farms uh, flourish. And this is, again, a kind of a side note, but I have never really appreciated until this last year how important the right butcher is. My (laughs) family did not get the cow butchered at the place they usually get butchered at. Consequently, I'm eating this meat that should not, I'm not even an expert in these things, but I'm looking at it and going, they just sawed it off. Oh, like. I have never eaten a worse roast. What uh, has happened? And I looked at my parents and said, it, we really have to plan this out farther in advance. There's, oh, it's just awful. Yeah, well, I, I, yeah, unfortunately, that's part of what happens. The other thing that happens is, is that, you know, the, the, there's huge opportunity for, for loss, right? So the conversion of the animal to actually edible consumption there's lots of variables that go into that, and then from a profitability standpoint, which is what you know I'm most passionate about. If those, if the butchers and the and the farmer are not in concert on how to process that, you can lose. I mean, we've we've done some studies across multiple processors and multiple farms, and there's as much of a as a 10% difference in the ultimate edible yield from the you know from the or from the start of the hanging animal to the time you have you know the steaks or the roasts and the ground out the back. That's not a small number when you're when you're a farmer trying to sell the you know when you're a farmer you're trying to sell the end product um, that, that you know that can be a sizable loss that's actually what when I've calculated it's actually it's the difference between profit and significant loss with that ten percent I can believe it having again this is part of my background in some ways and I I readily believe it so what were some general conclusions that you guys came to in this report. Well, uh, the general conclusions were number one um, that that the farmers want yield tracking, like what I was talking about, which is says, "Hey, I'm starting here and I'm going there. Let's make sure that I'm actually getting. I mean, they're, they're you know getting what I think I'm going to get, and if I'm not, I want feedback to be able to to do that. I, I, that's a really critical financial issue, right? That's one. Um, number two, and we've already kind of alluded to it, is, is that the, the whole scheduling issue is. Is pretty significant. I mean, you know, they're not sat. We, our, the survey said they weren't satisfied with schedule. We didn't go deep enough to really understand whether that was a flexibility issue or an availability issue. But my suspicion is based on talking to everybody, it, it's it's both, right? I mean, if 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 the schedule is way out there, there's no flexibility anyway. Um, and then number three is is that you know that, that, the, that these farmers really see the and again this is from the survey really see that the that the value added processing not just cutting in the steaks and or making the burger but sausage and charcuterie they see as a continued ability to, to be you know to add more value to what they have um, from a best practices standpoint I, you know it was interesting Brooks Miller was the person and he and Brooks Miller owns North Mountain Pastures 
and he, he, he collaborated with us on this. Um, he went out and did the, the, the tours. And um, the two things he came back with, the number one was to, to, to use establishment-wide software to track orders and yields. So like an ERP system, but you know, for a small manufacturing, you know, it's not really manufacturing, but it is deconstruction, that, that that was made really help efficiency and reduce mistakes. And then the second one, which, which I think was great, even though you know, you'd think, well, the best practices are around the actual process, but it was around you know, the employee culture, like really building a team of people. Because you know, you're in this case, it's a it's an orchestrated, you know, it's like you're taking a live animal and you're deconstructing it. And so the orchestration of the team doing that from a safety standpoint, a quality standpoint, and an efficiency standpoint requires a really great tight-knit culture. And then, and then the last thing, I, you know, I alluded to already, I said already, we found 21 funders. So this, this report actually literally lists, I, I think there's probably... I mean, I'm looking at the report. I don't remember how many total. There's probably close to 100 funders total in here. Maybe not, but there's 21 very specifically that said, yeah, I, you know, I might or I have, uh, I'd be willing to fund, um, you know, fund, a, a, you know, a processing facility. And then, and then the last thing was just this is chart of legal entities. I mean, everybody's got it. I don't care if you're looking to build a processor, you're, you're going to build a, a, you know, a, a Direct to consumer, yeah, e-commerce, uh, you know, food company, or you know, you're going to build a, you know, a newspaper route. Um, the, the resource here for around fund business structures is just a great resource um, around business structures that, that just people can look at, and it's in four or five pages, and just understand the, the complexity and uh, and the, and the differences in basically setting these things up. And that 21 funders is a really important aspect of this because. There's a lot of money that goes into putting up a processing facility, especially when you get into all of the legal things you have to do, all of the specific equipment that you need. It's not cheap. Yep, you're correct. They, it, it is not cheap to do this. So looking at this information, if someone's looking and I assume this, once again, this is generally your geographic area in Pennsylvania, which is great because that's part of the local aspect of this, they can look to this report and get an idea of, okay, if I want to start a butcher shop, these are some things to look at and keep in mind. Yeah, I'd take it even further. If they wanted to step a book, start a butcher shop, I would uh, implement a customer survey, a farmer survey, similar to what we did. They've got all the questions here and go find out what the demand is from the farmers in the region. Like, like I, I didn't even think about that until now, but if you're going to another region, I mean, the, the base premise here was how do we make sure that there's actually the demand for a processor? You know, what's the baseline that you do when you set, when you write a business plan or think about making that level of investment, well, you understand the demand, right? And so these questions are a real, what could be a real solid foundation for somebody to start asking farmers. I, I in retrospect, I, you know, or if somebody was to do it, I would say there's some slight tweaks I would do. But that that that, that was the whole point here. Let's find, let's give foundational information to either the existing processors or if somebody who wants to come in new to build a business plan. And and transferring this to somewhere else, the protocol. I mean, the the funders actually most of these funders might might not care geogra geographically. The best practices I suspect are pretty much fungible. And the survey, while it, 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 the results of the survey are not fungible, the survey itself could be deployed somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And that, again, is a point I'm going to point out here is that really getting some feedback and knowing what the actual demand and what customers want is so critical to this, whether you're raising food, just deconstructing food in this case, yeah. or whatever your business is. I mean, otherwise you get the fire phone and we don't want that. Yes, correct. Well, Ted, thank you so much for being on the show today. Is there any question I didn't ask you that you wish to provide information to the audience? No, you've done a great job, Terrence. This has been a really wonderful interview. I've enjoyed it immensely, and I look forward to, uh, to you know, hopefully your your listeners can use some of this information and, and uh, use it. I mean, if they this the uh, the 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 actual uh, guts of this. Um, uh, leg up study are on our website. So if somebody can go to our website. I assume you, you'll give them that information from your yep. website and, and they can go download this stuff from our website. And where else can people go to learn more about you and your work? 
uh, our website, www.kitchentableconsultants.com. Um, I'm also, we're also on LinkedIn. So if somebody wants to see us on LinkedIn, there's a bunch of stuff out there and uh, Facebook also. So you can look up kitchen table consultants on any of those things. It is, it is kitchen table consultants with an S. Um, we are based in, uh, in the mid Atlantic region, Pennsylvania. There are a couple of other kitchen table related businesses. So we are very friendly with all of them. So it's no big deal, but specifically to us, you want to be kitchen table consultants with an S. Well, thanks again for being on the show. Awesome. Thank you so much. Big thanks to Ted for being on the show today. And thank you for listening to the episode. You can learn more about Ted and his work by checking out the links in the show notes for his work. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe on whatever your podcast player of choice is. While you're there, leave us a review, letting others know how great the show is. Once again, this has been Terrence Slayhew and the Intellectual Agrarian Podcast reminding you to keep farming the dream.